from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Library Center for the Book, which is the reading promotion arm of the library. And we promote books, reading, literacy, and libraries in many different ways. Uh, we're closely involved with the National Book Festival, which we finished about a week ago on a wonderfully warm, well, wonderful day. It was a little too warm, but we had a large crowd. And on the table as you come in, I've put some extra copies of the uh, program if you didn't get one. And there are some other handouts out there, including the Center for the Books schedule and other items related to our activities. Uh, here at the library, one of our major activities in addition to the book festival are Books and Beyond Talks. We thank you for joining us for John Hench's talk. These are talks of, uh, by authors of new books that have some kind of a relationship to the Library of Congress. Often they're based on our collections. Uh, often they are a result of a project that has been developed with one of the divisions of the library. And we're always pleased to have uh, project co-sponsors. Uh, but invariably, they are a reflection of the Library of Congress as well as the book and the author. And we do it to make the point that in all of our reading promotion activities, uh, often we forget about the importance of one of the end results, and that is books, 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 and we are uh, deeply involved in the promotion end of things. These talks are videotaped for later uh, viewing on the Library of Congress's website, uh, and for that reason I ask you to turn off all things electronic. Uh, we will have a presentation from John about this wonderful new book by Corn published by Cornell University Press. Uh, then there'll be a brief period of questions and answers, and uh, John will repeat the question for the microphone, and uh, I want to say that by participating in the question and answer session, you are becoming part of, with your permission, uh, could be part of the webcast uh, eventually, so you are an important, have an important role to play. Uh, the book itself is Books as Weapons, Propaganda, Publishing, and the Battle for Global Markets in the Era of World War II. And John will be telling the story behind the book as well as making the point about this unusual partnership that resulted uh, between the U.S. government and American book publishers. Uh, I've known John Hinch for many years. Uh, he, uh, I worked with him when he was at the American Antiquarian Society as a former, he was a former vice president for collections and programs at AAS. Their titles are almost as complicated as those here at the Library of Congress. Uh, he worked there from 1973 until he retired. Uh, he determined just four years ago, and I know it to John, he couldn't believe it's been four years, but here it is. But he's put his time to very productive use because this is a, a book that um, I was privileged to, to learn about early on. I would recommended it to Cornell University Press for publication. Uh, it is beautifully produced, I think, by Cornell, and it's going to be a pleasure to uh, learn about it from John. I also should mention that the Center for the Book is joining the trend. We have a Facebook page. This book is already on it. You can learn about it. You can learn about previous talks. You can make comments about it, and you can make comments uh, in exchange with, with some of the program, future authors as well as past authors. I now would like to, uh, and then the, the book signing will follow uh, the presentation uh, roughly at one o'clock uh, after the question and answer period. It is now my pleasure to present my friend and a friend of many people in the audience, uh, John Hinch, to talk about his new book, Books as Weapons, Propaganda, Publishing, and the Battle for Global Markets in the Era of World War II. Let's give John a hand. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I appreciate your hospitality um, on this occasion, as on so many other occasions that I have attended programs here of one sort or another. 
uh, nice to see relatives and old friends in the audience, um, and a contingent of people from the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, without whose support this book would not exist. So thank you very much. I want to give you a brief um, informal overview of the book uh, before questions. I expect that I'm the only person in this room that has read the book through and through. Uh, I may be wrong, uh, but whether you've read the book or not by now doesn't really matter uh, because you can certainly ask questions whether you've uh, read the book or not. And I've found actually in other occasions that some of the best questions come from people who haven't read the book uh, and they're asking questions that uh, allow me to say, now why didn't I think of that or something I should have, uh, and make a note, note for second edition or something like that. So uh, think about questions um, uh, as we go along. Uh, I'll start with actually two very brief readings. Um, one from page one. This is the uh, opening two paragraphs of the introduction titled Books on the Normandy Beaches. On June 6th, 1944, D-Day, more than 150,000 Allied troops transported by the largest invasion fleet ever assembled gained a beachhead on the Normandy coast, beginning the campaign that led to the defeat of Nazi Germany and the liberation of millions of people. From these French beaches, the invading armies spread out, capturing the strategic port of Cherbourg, and in time, taking Paris. For several months after the first wave of forces had moved on, great numbers of fresh troops, along with military supplies, food, and medicine, were offloaded at various points along the 40 miles of coastline that extended from Utah to Sword Beaches, or in the large ports like Cherbourg and Le Havre, after their capture by the Allies. With the early landings came an unlikely weapon of war, crates of books. Only a few weeks after D-Day, these boxes, each weighing about 80 pounds and containing between 10 and 27 copies of two dozen different British and American books, divided equally between the two nations, were deposited on the beaches. Like the brave soldiers who had landed earlier, this odd cargo also suffered casualties. Weather and tides obliterated labels on a number of the boxes, causing damage and delays in getting them to French bookstores and news dealers. But in good time, the books reached the outlets where they were eagerly snapped up by customers, desperately hungry for reading material, different uh, from a world different from the one they had inhabited for too many dreadful years. And now my second reading, even briefer, is actually of the three epigraphs that are on page VII of the book. Books cannot be killed by fire. People die, but books never die. No man and no force can put thought in a concentration camp forever. No man and no force can take from the world the books that embody man's eternal fight against tyranny. In this war, we know, books are weapons. That was uh, part of a declaration by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Second one, books do not have their impact upon the mass mind, but upon the minds of those who would mold the mass mind, upon leaders of thought and formulators of public opinion. The impact of a book may last six months or several decades. Books are the most enduring propaganda of all. And that was written by an official of the Office of War Information, which was the government's chief propaganda agency during the war. And the third one is, the opportunity exists as it, may, as it never may again for American books to have an inside track to the world's bookshelves. That too was written by another Office of War Information official. I think these, if you haven't read the book, maybe all you really need is to read those three epigraphs because in a way that sums up, those three sum up the basic themes of the book. And I just, in, in kind of giving you an overview of it, I want to tackle those three in turn and to kind of um, uh, give you a sense of, of why they are there and why they're important to the narrative and argument of the book. First of all, the one about books as weapons. Uh, 
President Roosevelt uh, made that a very major pronouncement during the war uh, for both um, domestic morale purposes as well as for the purposes of this program that I'm going to be describing today, which was very decidedly one for overseas consumption. But actually, the notion of books as weapons had actually had been uh, earlier formulated uh, as almost um, an unofficial motto of the Council on Books and Wartime, which was a private, nonprofit wartime organization put together by the American book publishers as their way to concentrate their efforts on helping win the war by continuing to raise morale at home as well as, as overseas. And uh, it was actually coined by the chairman of the Council on Books and Wartime, who was W.W. Uh, w. Norton. Uh, you've seen his name on more than one book, I'm sure. Uh, the notion of, and oh, the Office of War Information, of course, also used this widely, um, that motto. Now, you know, all of us here are interested in books, and we, um, uh, I think, tend often to sacralize books, which is, is good. Uh, but the notion that if, you, if people read, they automatically, of course, um, develop uh, good thoughts and, and honorable behavior and all this sort of thing. Well, of course, that isn't actually true. And, and um, books are such, have been throughout history such a double-edged sword. Uh, books can uh, build up, they can tear down, they can be on the side of the angels, they can be on the side of the devil, they can create and they can destroy, they can foment revolution or they can support the status quo. The uh, uh, former Librarian of Congress, Archibald McLeish, who I'm sure would have spoken from this podium had this building been built when he was uh, Librarian of Congress, uh, once wrote, he challenged Americans to recognize the power of books as truly as the Nazi mob which dumped them on the fire. And I'm sure many of you do know that uh, shortly after Hitler took um, power, his brown shirts uh, had this enormous series of bonfires in Germany where all uh, suspect literature, much of it, of course, by Jewish authors uh, or, in, or communist authors or those who would be in any way unfriendly to the Reich, uh, were literally burned. And that became such a powerful symbol of, uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, Nazi regime, and even though books themselves may, may take on and uh, may produce evil results, I think uh, uh, most sane people don't condone burning them. So that was uh, uh, an important part of this notion of books as weapons. Hitler used the burning of books as weapons, and of course he used his own book, Mein Kampf, as a powerful weapon of war, uh, and so what McLeish was doing was trying to um, get the Americans to realize that books could also be useful to tear down what Hitler had tried to uh, uh, create. The second epigraph, the one that, uh, oh, well, let me, I, actually one more point I want to make about the <coughs> books as weapons, and that is that uh, the notion of books as weapons implies that, that books, some way or another, have the power to perform cultural work that they have the power to perform political work, that they have the power to influence history in some way or another. And you, you think of ways, of course, in which books have influenced history, and Mein Kampf is certainly one of them, but uh, others would be, uh, or print, the, uh, uh, the works of Martin Luther and the, uh, and the works of uh, the encyclopedists uh, in the uh, coming of the French Revolution. But, Another point I want to make in this regard is that this notion that books have the power to do work culturally and to uh, influence history was really part of the professional ideology of book publishers. Book publishing was as much a craft as it was a business. Nobody wanted to lose money, but they didn't put all emphasis on the bottom line. They wanted to publish good and important books. They felt that they were doing good work and that uh, this is one of the things that differentiated them from the maker of widgets and, and uh, 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 
uh, soap, bathroom soaps and, and toothpaste and so on. Um, and it uh, was very important for them to understand uh, that was the kind of psychological benefit that got working, that, were, that, were, that got many of them to work for wages that were far below what they might have made in other, in other forms of, of business enterprise. Okay, now that the books do not have their impact upon the mass mind. Uh, this statement was an important influence on the, on the creation of this program that I started to describe in my first reading, and that actually was an important part of what was called consolidation propaganda during the war. There are all sorts of different kinds of propaganda, but uh, consolidation propaganda is a form of, of propaganda that follows uh, battle, uh, battle time uh, propaganda. Uh, during the war, of course, lots of propaganda was used. It was uh, used both domestically to keep the home front's morale up and used against the enemy to try to uh, break his will, to try to uh, um, uh, to create disinformation, to, uh, to create uh, uh, targets uh, of opportunity, uh, or to dissuade them from creating targets of opportunity upon the, uh, and, and primarily on the battlefield, propaganda was designed to get the enemy soldier to surrender. Uh, but prop consolidation propaganda was different. It really was kind of a, a program that was put into place in that period of time between the cessation of battle and the full uh, uh, coming of peace and, and, and security. Uh, the job of consolidation propagandists was varied, but among the goals was to uh, maintain calm, Right after D-Day, for example, um, consolidation propaganda of various forms was, was introduced into France, and this, of course, proceeded throughout Europe and the rest of the world. But to maintain calm, uh, there was no way that, to know how the French would respond uh, entirely to the, uh, uh, to the American troops. And so another uh, one was to ensure compliance with the orders of the liberating armies and what, with whatever uh, temporary military government might ensue, uh, as well as to, uh, and this was one of the chief military goals, was also to, um, uh, to reduce the need by calming the population, getting them to obey orders without protest or insurrection, was a way of reducing the need for occupation troops, or as many occupation troops as they might otherwise need. And remember, the end of the war in Europe was not the end of the war in, um, in uh, this, uh, the, war, the Second World War as a whole. I mean, when France was liberated, there were still were many other nations to liberate. And even when Germany surrendered, there was still Japan to worry about, and, and the, uh, the military did not want to commit more than uh, the minimum amount of forces in Europe because they would be needed uh, to fight and to win finally over the Japanese. Another role of, of uh, uh, particularly as it affected um, the psyche of, of civilians, was to disintoxicate, as one of the officials said, to disintoxicate the European people from German propaganda, the propaganda that Goebbels had been so successful in disseminating. Uh, in the years that um, uh, the Nazis had been in power and the years that they had ruled over the overrun countries. The notion was that, uh, uh, that, that uh, that's about all that uh, Europeans had had, um, was Nazi propaganda, Nazi censorship for four, five, or six years. They'd heard nothing from the free world other than scattered broadcasts on uh, uh, the BBC, which uh, they listened to it uh, at, at risk of their lives. And so this was designed to kind of counteract that, to disintoxicate them. Uh, the other notion of, of, of this, of course, was that books were a special medium among media, that they primarily uh, was, were a, a way of getting at the opinion makers in any society. Not that there weren't popular books, but these would have to be thoughtful books, 
books that uh, dealt with ideas and policies and so on, and that by aiming them at the uh, leaders of, of opinion and the elites in the overrun nations and eventually in Germany itself, they figured that this would get more bang for the buck because these people, in effect, would create reading communities. Uh, they would influence their family members. They would influence their associates, their employees, the people in their community, and so on. And obviously, books could only play in overseas uh, a significant role uh, during the um, consolidation phase because books were not very useful for getting the German GIs to surrender or for getting the German uh, public uh, through the underground uh, markets to um, uh, read a book when they should be reading little pamphlets and so on. So, but it was particularly useful in this particular consolidation phase. The third epigraph, uh, where, the opportunity, where it says that the opportunity exists for American books to have an inside track to the world's bookshelves, uh, is the most important factor in explaining why the American book publishers were so involved in this program that, that I have written about here. American book publishers had been, for the most part, very little interested in taking, uh, working very hard to get their books abroad. Uh, they enjoyed a, a continental market here in, the, uh, in North America that was large enough to provide them with uh, significant pro uh, uh, profits. They figured that the expense and bother of sending small numbers of copies of American books to booksellers abroad or even dealing with European booksellers or British booksellers to sell the rights to publish their books abroad just wasn't worth the effort. But somehow, almost as soon as the war began, they set their sights higher. Even, I found evidence that even within a month or so after Hitler invaded Poland, American book publishers already thinking of ways that they might actually begin to take market share away from the British, which were the publishers who had the best world market system in the world because it was co-equal with the British Empire and now the emerging British Commonwealth. So they'd done very well in creating new markets um, during the war, mainly the soldier market. And all these guys would be coming back, of course, and hoped that they would buy books when they came back, having read the armed services editions overseas. But uh, they also, for the first time, wanted to get serious about finding new markets abroad. They were able to do this by capitalizing on, on two issues, on two matters. One, there was an enormous hunger for books overseas. I found in archives everywhere countless statements of, of civilians saying, I would rather have books than food. I would give anything to have a book that doesn't parrot uh, Nazi propaganda. And so here was this kind of demand, the sense of demand overseas for books. And the other reason was, as I've kind of already indicated, the weakness of the other international publishing nations. The British book trade had been severely damaged during the war. Um, it was Britain, the British publishing industry, was under far more severe rationing um, uh, regi uh, regimentations than the American publishing trade was. Uh, their uh, labor shortage was greater. Uh, they also had suffered enormous losses of back stock, of current stock of their books, uh, when the, um, uh, the German Luftwaffe bombed warehouses uh, in, uh, uh, in Germany, in, in London, uh, destroying literally millions of books. And uh, libraries were also destroyed as well. So, and the British found, of course, a lot of their, um, their lines of communication to markets in the empire abroad were obviously uh, not possible given conditions of war. Uh, Germany, which is also another major international book trade, particularly in science, engineering, technology, that trade had been completely uh, uh, morally, um, uh, had become morally bankrupt. 
the French also had, um, had had a good international book trade uh, within their possessions abroad as well as within, say, Quebec and many parts of Latin America as well, but it too was, was uh, greatly weakened as well. But the chief obstacle was the British book trade to, uh, uh, to Americans' um, efforts to uh, establish new markets abroad, and it was uh, uh, their uh, efforts to take away some markets that got them uh, into battles with the British uh, throughout the war and actually for many years afterwards. So there was uh, a lot of competition going on during this time, a competition certainly with traditional uh, British markets, but also a lot of cooperation because this program of getting these books abroad uh, was actually, um, and distributed abroad, was actually a joint undertaking of the British uh, and American um, governments directly under the command of Schaeff, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, and General Eisenhower uh, was really the commander of this, of this program. Uh, now, I mentioned these books that were brought ashore in the weeks after D-Day. That was a program that ultimately did not succeed in doing the job because those books were books that were already had already been published, were drawn from publishers' um, warehouse stocks or from bookstores or whatever, uh, did not, were not available because of great demand in the United States, were not available in the quantities would be necessary that would be necessary. And therefore, um, the Office of War Information and the Council on Books in Wartime created a, a corporation called Overseas Editions Incorporated, which would select, carefully select, and publish new editions in paperback of books that would be paperback, small, easy to transport, that would be shipped abroad, would be sold through normal outlets, bookstores, and whatever, they were not to be given away, and that these were really the books that ultimately had whatever effect they had. And there were ultimately, between the overseas editions and a parallel series created out of the Office of War Information Office in London that, um, that did the trick. And those were a total of about 92 separate editions of about um, 40 different titles. So it was a relatively small program, but they were carefully selected. So that's the overview, and I hope this has um, uh, given you enough um, uh, of, a, of a prime priming of the pump to uh, ask some questions, either about anything I've spoken about, or, or even better, things I haven't spoken about. Yes. The question is, how long did this program go on, and um, uh, was there any uh, possibility that it could be repurposed for uh, use in the Cold War? Um, the program started uh, actually in the um, not that many weeks, bef months before D-Day, actually. Um, the, and the first effort, of course, was to select the, 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 the books that would be uh, taken from existing publishers' stocks. The notion of um, doing the um, overseas editions uh, came a bit later when it became clear that the existing stocks would not um, uh, be done, but that didn't really get off the ground for actually several months after D-Day for various reasons of, of congressional funding, opposition to it for various reasons, uh, and so on. Um, and the books were pretty much distributed by uh, VE Day and VJ Day, and uh, the Office of War Information actually uh, was disbanded about a month after, one, one or two months after VJ Day, and the Council on Books and Wartime was um, uh, disbanded at the end of 1945. So, those programs did not exist. Some of the machinery that these had put in place, that is, using government officials abroad, eventually through the U.S. Uh, Information Service, to broker the sale of American book rights to European publishers as soon as they got back in business, 
after the war was over. That continued, and that was a mechanism by which a lot of American cookbooks got into, uh, uh, into Europe and Asia um, after this program was disbanded. The U.S. government did mount a lot of programs during the Cold War, uh, some of which were certainly uh, the notions of which were inspired by these projects, but there was no direct continuation. Can you compare the book program to the film program where people like uh, John Ford and Frank Capra and the propaganda films for the government? Similarities, differences? Um, I can't, um, I don't really know an awful about, oh, the question is wh what are the similarities and dissimilarities between this program and the, uh, the government's uh, film program? Uh, the Office of Inf Inf War Information was also involved in some domestic book programs as well. Those were not terribly successful and there was um, a lot of suspicion of those among, uh, from Congress, particularly from Republicans and Southern Democrats who thought all of this would be uh, Roosevelt uh, propaganda. So that was abandoned fairly early. Uh, then the Capra films and so on you're talking about were mainly for domestic use of wartime morale. And of course these were for the, the folks overseas. Um, there was, OWI also had a parallel consolidation phase program of films overseas as well which actually paled in comparison to this one. And I find it a great irony, uh, while we're on the subject of films, that, that one of the sources of Goebbels' most telling propaganda, that is the notion that uh, America was a nation either of dissolute capitalists or, uh, or gangsters, was very much very obviously to many people, or it was a product of the popularity of American Hollywood films during the 1930s. The Ginger Roger, Fred Astaire films where they were all, you know, club goers and all this sort of thing, or the George Raft and uh, whatever the other great um, uh, Cagney. Cagney and so on was. And, and literally, so I, f I find a great irony that, that this not quite so mass medium of books was tasked to under undo the damage done by American films during the war. And it wasn't just the, uh, the people in France or in Germany that felt this way. Our, our closest allies, the Brits, had the same stereotypes of us as well. Melissa. They did. Uh, they, they were primarily nonfiction. Uh, very few uh, works of fiction, uh, but let me begin by saying that almost all of them were books that had been published within the last four or five years. They were books that had been popular in the United States. They were books that had many of them been bestsellers, uh, Book of the Month Club selections. They were works for the most part of middle brow appeal. Um, and the importance of this was, was at least twofold. One is that they, these were the books that were hot properties for the American publishers and they hoped would be hot properties for the uh, European publishers who might buy the rights to translate them or publish them in Britain or so on. They also, because they were books that had been produced for the American public and were now being selected for their propaganda value, that they would not seem to be, they were not made to be propaganda. They were books that ordinary Americans were reading. They had not been written by the government to try to tell, uh, you know, to, to convey the government's propaganda on them. Um, among the, 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 um, uh, the uh, novels were um, uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, William Soroyan's um, The uh, Human Comedy. But most of the books were uh, uh, books of nonfiction, books about public affairs, current affairs, um, uh, books, uh, for example, Walter Lippmann's U.S. Foreign Policy and War, U.S. War Aims, um, uh, uh, Nevins and Commager's History, Brief History of the United States. A surprising number of books were about the war itself, and particularly about the war in the Pacific. Uh, 
And I, at first I thought, you know, what, the last thing if I were in, in France would want to <laughs> read about probably was war. Uh, but that was very pointed, and that gets to your question about the criteria. They had to meet, you know, to counteract Goebbels, they needed to put America's best foot forward. But the books that were about the Pacific War were intended to um, tell the Europeans what we'd been doing during the war, which they actually knew apparently not an awful lot about. The fact that we were not just waging war in the European theater, but also in the Pacific. And so, you know, the, uh, the GIs might have been greeted um, with kisses and flowers, but maybe a few days later, they were saying, what took you so long, you know? And this was by way of saying, this is what has taken us so long, we've been fighting the Japanese as well. And this notion of these books about the Pacific War were particularly useful for France and for the Netherlands because we wanted to convince them, number one, that we, we could not, we could not, they could not expect us to do much about um, uh, restoring the economy, rebuilding the economy and infrastructure of Europe until we defeated Japan. And, you know, you, you in France and the Netherlands, you lost colonies to the Japanese. And we would welcome whatever you can possibly do to help us defeat the Japanese. Now, all of these books about the Pacific War were somewhat mooted because uh, these had thought to be important uh, during the year that or so that it was expected to take to defeat Japan, but of course the bombing of Hiroshima just kind of um, just cut that uh, motive dead. Other questions? Yes. Obviously, the chief story here is about Europe, but I'm also interested in knowing and having read have, having read the book. I know you address this a little bit. Well, how American publishers thought about doing about the books. Yes, it was a totally different story. Um, the the way in which um, uh, the, the the structure of of the American book program for Asia was quite different from the American book program for um, for Japan and China and uh, other parts in the in the Far East, um, and that was for a number of reasons. Um, originally, there had been thoughts of having overseas editions published, translated into. Uh, Japanese and Chinese for use over there, but uh, again, there was that program had really not even started before um, Hiroshima, and so those there was nothing ready at that point. They had begun um, the OWI um, uh, Pacific people and the Army Pacific people were had begun to stockpile some books uh, in places like the Philippines once that was reliberated. Um, but um, it was not, uh, there was no coherent program to actually choose and uh, to, uh, uh, to publish separate editions of these for those markets. Uh, eventually, it took, and actually took a while to get a formal program going of, of translations. But basically, um, and whereas another enormous difference is that in Germany, for example, uh, the military government uh, completely tore down most of the institutions of German life and culture and certainly the mass, the, the media of all. So, uh, you know, when, when um, Germany surrendered, there really was no printing, publishing, broadcasting, book trade left. And that would be recreated through uh, programs of licensing and registering. Uh, and uh, as part of that was um, meant to be a program of checking on the, uh, the wartime record of the individuals, um, you know, getting into, who had applied to get back into publishing or to get into publishing, what had they done in the war and how, uh, what, how strong were their Nazi connections and so on. Uh, that petered out um, after a while, uh, the effort to do that petered out after a while after the threat uh, to compete in propaganda against the Soviets became stronger than the desire to root out every last branch of Nazism. So in Japan, that was not the case. Uh, the Japanese publishers and, and printers and so on were allowed to stay in business, basically. They were under close supervision of the uh, 
SCAP, Supreme Command uh, Allied Powers, under General MacArthur. And a book had to be um, approved uh, f to be uh, republished over there. Um, but the Japanese publishing trade got into business almost immediately. And they first started uh, actually just probably reprinting books from their, um, uh, you know, from um, that they had published before. Um, and there's a fabulous collection of the books that were published during the U.S. occupation of Japan at the University of Maryland Library, the McKeldin Library, thanks to uh, Gordon Prang, who wrote The History of Pearl Harbor. He worked for military, uh, the uh, uh, information division over there, and somehow managed to uh, get those books for his, where he taught the University of Maryland. I don't know why they didn't come here or whatever, but a great coup. So does that uh, sort of answer your question? John. John, I'm trying to, I learned a lot from reading your book, and as some people know, we work, we do have a collection at the Library of Congress of the Armed Services of Research, which is an archival uh, set, which is in the Rare Books Division, and I was fortunate enough to work uh, on that uh, collection in this sense, that we had a kind of an oral history project and invited back in, a 19, in 1983 a number of people who'd worked on that project. But your book gave me a new perspective on the ASEs, but am I right in thinking that perhaps the ASEs compared to the overseas editions really fell more in the category of recreational reading for the troops <coughs> rather than having the, as the overseas <coughs> editions did, really this long range publishing <coughs> look at what was gonna happen after the war to yeah. the apparatus. Yes, that's the, that's the case for the most for the for the most part. Though uh, my sense is that um, as you know, the this the extreme probability, if not the certainty, that we were going to win the war um, came on uh, came upon us. Um, that the earlier uh, goal of the Armed Services Editions to provide mostly entertainment right. for the troops, westerns, um, lots some fiction. fiction, lots of fiction, westerns, mysteries, but a lot of um, a lot of classics as well. Um, you know, poetry. Uh, no Shakespeare. I'm struck by the fact there was no Shakespeare, and he wasn't. His works were in the public domain. You know, it wasn't any problem. Um, but toward the end of the war, more of the titles seemed to be books about the 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 future after war about the peace. They were either kind of outlining what the goals of the United States would be after the war, as well as uh, training, uh, getting the GIs to think about what they might do. One of the titles is, um, So You Want to Go into Radio, or something like that. And it was in you know, other books that might give some sense of, uh, of, of what careers might be, might be hot after the war. Um, there certainly were careful, I mean, there were, these were 40 titles. Um, Armed Service Edition was over 1,300 titles 22 and 22 million copies. And so it was a much greater undertaking in that regard. And not every book um, was selected. They were, uh, uh, they, again, the, there was a piece of legislation called the Soldier Voting Act, which, um, while setting up the groundwork for soldiers to vote in elections overseas, also prohibited um, the circulating two GIs of any books or magazines or pamphlets or whatever that might contain uh, material uh, that might be considered uh, soliciting the votes of for a candidate, and again, this was another one of the anti-Roosevelt pieces of legislation. So there were, for example, uh, a major part of the of the overseas edition series. There were two two different books about the Tennessee Valley Authority, one of the the main um, uh, uh, projects of the of the New Deal, um, which were designed very purposely. They were included because they would suggest to Europeans that that uh, the United States. Europeans who were used to much more regulated society, certainly in Nazi Germany and in the Soviet Union and in other nations in Europe, that, that the United States, that social planning could go on in a democracy. 
But these books would not have been allowed, obviously, and were not permitted to be in the Armed Services editions because they um, could be seen as, as, uh, um, as, as political in tone. And another difference would be format. Format, the right. Right. I should, you know, I meant to bring uh, some of these books, uh, but the Armed Service editions, if you know anything about them, they were oblong books like that and printed that way because of the, uh, to gain the capacity of presses that were pretty much idle during the war. The Armed Services, or the overseas editions, were upright, more the general uh, U.S. and foreign uh, paperback format. But when I saw the first one I ever saw, which got me into collecting them, which got me into writing this book, researching writing this book, it just looked so different. Um, it, it, well, if any of you, oh, there's pictures in here. If, if, if you think of, if you've been to Paris or you've seen French paperbacks from the 30s or 40s or 50s or even today, their covers are very unornamented. They tend to be purely typographical, maybe except for a colophon or something like that. Usually tan co covers with uh, the title in red and the rest of the text in black. And that's what these overseas editions looked like. And that was absolutely on purpose. They were done that way so that Europeans, beginning with the French, which was the first target audience, would see these t as being familiar to them, looking familiar to them. Uh, they wouldn't know what to do, maybe, with an armed services edition with that very odd format. And so uh, it was a brilliant stroke, I think, on the part of uh, uh, Chester Kerr, whom some of you may know or know of. Chester Kerr was uh, the long time, after the war, the long time director of Yale University Press. Um, and he was the uh, head honcho of this particular, the overseas editions program. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I should have said that. I apologize. These, the books were, the overseas editions were p produced in English and in translation into French, uh, Italian, German, and Dutch. So uh, they were um, plenty of books in French to circulate there. But again, um, and, and although, you know, again, there may, have, there may have been ways in which they might have done some, uh, uh, you know, a Danish ed editions or whatever, uh, they figured that um, since these were aimed at elites, that elites would probably, in many countries, even in France, elites, some elites at least, would be able to read the English. Um, and certainly that would have been the case in, in the Netherlands and in Denmark and Norway um, and other places. And, and in the absence of uh, books in, 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 say, in Chinese um, or Japanese, um, some of the English language books were used um, in Asia, as were some of the French language books, because certainly in parts of Asia, of course, France was, French was a, a, a common language. So um, it was, uh, but you know, translation was the, that was a factor in helping delay the introduction of these because, um, and it was probably the one that the Council and the Office of War Information handled less expertly, in part because even though almost everybody involved the project at the government or the council level had come into these offices from the world of publishing, uh, and they knew how to produce books, edit them, publish them, produce them. They didn't know how to translate them, particularly um, because an American publisher would normally be, um, uh, uh, you know, would be trans the other way around. And so, uh, but, and I don't know what they would have done. They were saved by the great number of European intellectuals and academics and writers and so on who had, um, come to the United States as refugees from the Nazis, many of them who uh, settled in New York, which was where both the Office of War Information's project was headquartered and the council was headquartered. And so it was this group, as well as um, uh, some other refugees and others uh, from um, other in universities uh, throughout the country, mostly in, in the East, were, were selected to, to do these. But there was time constraints. 
Uh, it, it took a lot of effort to get them to do these works on time and, and uh, so on. But uh, um, there was a, a cluster of these people that lived, resided in Kew Gardens, Queens, as a matter of fact. I've seen, I know where all of them lived. <laughs> Others, yes? Uh, my recollection is it was about, in contrast to 122 million of the overseas editions, it was about five or six, armed services, armed services I mean, five or six um, thousand, uh, a million copies. Uh, but there were, you know, hundreds if not of thousands, if not millions more that were distributed um, both, both before the, um, uh, overseas editions were, as well as uh, under the auspices of other entities uh, in Europe after the, the war was over. So probably, uh, well, I don't know, 10, 15 millions of these books were specifically uh, uh, brought into Europe after the war. And again, aiming as they were at uh, not mass markets, uh, but to get leaders to then communicate the ideas in them to others. Um, that probably did a, a lot of work. I'm usually asked, to what was there any effort to try to find out what the, uh, the effect of this was? And um, the answer is there really wasn't much. Um, uh, unlike the Armed Services editions, addictions, addictions, as John knows, um, where there uh, is, uh, and I've seen them at, at Princeton University, uh, where the Council on Books and Wartime Archives are, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of letters, of, of, um, of um, uh, thank you letters and uh, fan letters from GIs thanking them for these books. Um, a lot of letters were sent uh, directly to the authors of the books and so on. But in the archives at Princeton for the overseas editions, there's only one letter, um, and it's a rave. Uh, but um, and I think that the reason for that is that, um, again, the, the, the armed service editions were, were meant for GIs, Americans, who would be able to communicate this easily. But these were meant for Europeans and Asians and so on. And there was nothing on the books that would indicate a mailing address uh, for them to send a letter to. Um, and by the time that people might have gotten around to thinking, well, I ought to write a letter, um, assuming they had any paper to write on or any postage stamps. Um, they, uh, they wouldn't have known where to write because by this time the Council on War Information and the, uh, the Office of War Information, the Council on Books in Wartime were defunct. Um, so and there was no effort really. To, right. Uh, would you want to just hold that up, John? Uh, there was no uh, real way they could have communicated with them uh, in any case. And there was nobody left um, uh, in the agencies to even try to mount some sort of public opinion campaign uh, overseas for it. It's a shame, but they sold well. They were sold. Uh, they were meant to be sold. And they, they basically sold out. Uh, uh, some of the later titles may not have because they might have come a little too late. Other questions? Susan. My, my sister here. I'd love to know whether you're looking for back now in the Indian Museum or what you're going to do next. Uh, this is my sister asking my, this question. Am I, what am I going to do next? Am I going to simply retire? Well, I've, I'd like to, um, I've, I've told people that the one thing I do miss, I've not had um, as much time just to read for pleasure as I had thought I would, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But I am working right now on another project that, um, you know, draws certainly on, on much of the same material as I uh, work here, and that's on the uh, magazines that were um, designed for, uh, that were especially published for uh, the American forces overseas during the war. And there were about, um, somewhere at least two dozen, maybe 30 of these magazines that uh, did publish special editions for the GI to get the support of the government, the military, the Army Library Service, and, the, uh, uh, and it, their counterparts for the Navy and the Marines um, 
they had to be printed on lightweight paper, and they had to be printed without the advertising that was in the domestic editions. And um, about a half a dozen of the magazines went one step further and also reduced, photographically reduced the size of the magazines uh, all the greater to um, save weight for shipments abroad. And the big three were Time, Newsweek, and The New Yorker. And all three of them were printed on reduced size lightweight paper, which were varyingly called pony editions or battle babies, as Newsweek called them. Uh, my take on this, and I'm really kind of just the beginning of it, I've done quite a bit of research in the New Yorker archives at New York Public Library. I've done a little bit of research in the Time, Inc. archives in New York. But basically, um, my take is that, that these magazines, by the participation, just like the book publishers of these magazines, they were able to help the pub, you know, support morale, support the public interest, do the nation's work during the war. But, and so they were able to do good, but this also enabled them to do well in terms of financially and in terms of business ventures and so on. Uh, just as the publishers were geared up to expand overseas, either through their own offices or through greater activity with partners abroad, the publishers of magazines also were um, doing the same thing. And in fact, um, there is a clear line of dissent, uh, I think it's true with Newsweek as well, but certainly with, um, with, um, the, uh, with Time magazine, uh, between the creation of editions for the troops overseas, which uh, as, the, as the pacified areas expanded, they were now being actually published, printed, in Italy or in France or in the Philippines or whatever uh, for distribution abroad. These are the direct ancestors of the multitude of foreign editions of Time magazine that exist today abroad. John? Time to sign the books. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to uh, thank John really for a wonderful talk and uh, goodness the wealth of knowledge you have from gain, gain from this research I can see is going to be the basis for a number of books I hope I really hope do I want to write another book? <laughs> <laughs> well you have an invitation to come back when that next book is is ready uh, please join me in thanking John now and talking with him later it's a great job thank you, thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.